thank you all for being here this evening. It's a pleasure to be back. It's been almost three days since I was here in this room, and uh, I was here for an amazing teacher's workshop on Tuesday. And one of the things that I found so interesting was the different ways that people looked at the pictures, and we also uh, thought about some poems and the different perspectives that, that different people had on them. But then also, these were all teachers, and they were thinking about what do you do when you're back in the classroom with these materials and with the different views that, that students would have as they looked at some of the photographs or thought about some of the poems that, that we discussed. Um, so I'll be very interested in your own sense of um, these photographs that are in the exhibit just across the hallway. If you haven't already been there, please make sure that you stop in and, and take a look. Um, but I'll, I'll be talking in particular about four of them that have kind of caught my attention. And one of the things that I'm interested in, in general, is how do works of art catch the attention of somebody hearing or reading or seeing them? Um, a song, what does it do uh, to catch your attention? Um, if you Google Gangnam style, what is it about that mess that is so entrancing that uh, everybody in the world has, has seen it and there is now an MIT Gangnam style, believe it or not, and it's really well done. And Noam Chomsky uh, appears in it um, and talks about Chomsky Gangnam, Gangnam style. Um, how do those things happen? What is it about a photograph or a work of art that might engage our attention and draw us in? And are there any generalizations that we can make about that process? What is it about a particular poem that might work the, the same way? How does a poem engage a reader or many readers or generations of readers? Um, and what I thought I'd do is talk briefly about four of the photographs that particularly arrested uh, my own attention as I looked at this wonderful um, catalog of the exhibit and other photographs in the collection that are not actually in the exhibit. Um, it's edited by Mr. Chang Jae Li, um, who also wrote uh, a preface to it. Uh, but I'll be talking about four of these that, that happened to catch my attention in particular. And I'll have a few things to say about that, but I'm also hoping that you may want to say something about these that I'll have on the screen, and, and just tell me what you notice about them. And we'll start that way. And then what I'd like to do is, is share a few of my favorite poems from Korea with you. A, a couple of landscape poems from long, long ago, from the 16th century, in fact. One by a, a male, uh, one by a female, um, but both of them in their own ways iconic in the Shijo tradition in Korean literature. Um, and they have certain meanings in the history of Korea and its culture. And one of the things that I found very interesting is that those meanings are still there, but there are lots of others as you begin to look and think about and, and reflect on these materials. I promise to spare you um, the uh, grave injury of my ukulele version of one of these Shijo poems. Um, but back in September, I was at a international uh, pen conference and was talking a little bit about the Shijo. And at the end, I did take out the ukulele and, and uh, sing my own musical setting, if you can call it that, for this very famous Shijo poem. And what was so much fun about it was it was just like when I was in Korea in the Peace Corps back in 1735, when I would be stuck on a line of poetry and I would ask, well, what, what does this mean? As I was meeting Korean people, sometimes on buses or trains or just out somewhere, um, and first came the delight that a foreigner was there in Korea speaking the Korean language and aware of this poet, and then asking a question. 
And that same sense of delight is something that I think has kept me moving along uh, in a, I tend to think of it, rather lively and engaged fashion with these materials. I do love Korea and Korean people and literature and poetry in particular. And I hope to share a bit of that with you. And then as I calm down a little bit, after talking about these two 16th century poems, I'll talk about two 20th century poems that I think have some connections in an interesting way with the photographs that are there uh, for you to see in the gallery and then we'll be looking at on the screen. And Chang Jae is going to also read a poem that has meant a great deal to him, uh, a Korean poem by Kim Soo Young, a mid 20th century uh, Korean poet. And then we'll circle back to look at these um, photographs once again and see if there are some generalizations we can draw from uh, this process of exploration. But um, I, I also have to mention, this is a, it may not look like it, but it's a very special day for me. Um, my wife and I were married on November 9th, 44 years ago. And we were married in Fort Wayne, Indiana, her hometown. Uh, then we came to New York City for a weekend. And uh, so for me to come back to the city on this particular evening is, is a very special occasion indeed. And I'm glad to say that although I'm not there also, um, she's taking care of our granddaughter, Isabel, over in Astoria, and uh, we'll be all getting together and celebrating in a little bit, but uh, this, this is a special occasion. But let me look at a couple of these photographs uh, with you, and I'll, I'll say something or other, and, and then I'll ask you if you have any uh, additional comments. Ku Wangsan's photograph, A Flock of Children, you'll notice the date on it is 1945. Um, and in the book, the gallery book, you'll find really interesting notes on a lot of the photographs. Um, and I won't read those over, but if you get a chance to look through the book, uh, you'll find some very interesting things there on a, a number of the photographs uh, that you'll see. 1945. Um, it's a striking photograph is one obvious thing to say about it. There are these kids up in a tree. It really captures your attention right away by that gesture, this thing up there full of children. That's what drew me right away to this picture. Uh, but let me ask you, what, what do you notice about it? Is there anything in particular or something a general observation, yes. Freedom. Freedom. Where does that come from in your view of it? Because it's to compare with 1945, it's independence and children. The children, after as climbing up the tree, and then look at them. They look. They look very peaceful, having fun, and then so. I could feel immediately that freedom under the like a colonization for 36 years and then I could immediately connect with that. So you connect mm -hmm. what you see, this image, mm -hmm. to Korea's history, its emergence from the Japanese colonial occupation, which lasted from 1910 to 1945. Right. Um, you can see the joy there in those kids um, and sort of feel that that might be something widely shared at that time. What what about others? Um, well, the children are having to dress, so it would indicate that perhaps it is around the time of the uh, Japanese surrender. Mm -hmm. And the, the adults are probably preoccupied uh, with the messiness and the confusion of that time. The children maybe have a little more freedom than normal to um, go out and do things um, on their own. And um, they probably have been, maybe they've just come from a parade where they're waving their shirts. Or, uh, it could be any number of things. That. Right. It would seem that it is probably late summer after the uh, liberation, after the um, you know the Japanese surrender. 
Right. And, and indeed, there are children there, and there are not adults there. They might be doing something different. Um, there's some... Yes? I live in New York City, and I rarely uh, go to Korea as often. I really do not go to Korea often, but when I went to Korea, for me to look for that kind of horizon, that kind of tree, without uh, having all this uh, industrial revolution happened in Korea, this was Korea that I used to know. Yes. When I was born just a few years, uh, I mean, a year before that, I lived uh, in this environment, uh, sky white, the earth was <laughs> really barren. When I went back after 30 some years, I thought I was a foreigner to my home right, country. Right. Yeah. And from then on, I decided to go back more often, and the more buildings came in. So tell me where I should go to see one spot like that in Korea. To me, that is that was real Korea to right, me. Right. It is in my soul, at the bottom of the heart. So you didn't even, uh, I didn't even have to read the book. I was right at home looking right, at it. Right. Yeah. Because for, of the for scar. some people, this really goes, as you say, right to the, right to your heart. You you recognize that place. You recognize that moment. You recognize that landscape. Now, I mean, one of the the, the startling things for me every time I go to Korea, is to see how the, the landscape terrain of the peninsula has been carved up by the highway system. And it's not at all the flowing series of valleys and hills and then mountains that was really characteristic of the landscape up until the later decades of the 20th century. It's a very different place. And almost anywhere you go, they're building high-rise apartments and constructing new towns and establishing uh, new kinds of centers of communication and other things. It's a very, very different, different Korea. And, and one of the questions might be, where can we travel now to get back in touch uh, with that Korea, the one that is there in, in this photograph? Well, let me look at another one with you. And thanks. I think I know the answer. If you go to Gyeongju, I think you will see the flatland. <laughs> There are some places where you can still go and still see, but it's very difficult not to see buildings. Not anyway. Lee um, Hyungnok Muddy Street in Sogedong, Seoul, 1954. Um, one of the things I loved about the picture and which caught my attention was the mess. It's a mess. And you look at it and you say, oh, that's a mess. And your brain is saying, it's a mess, it's a mess. Look, look, it's such a mess. And there's something about a mess that draws one's attention, I think. And then you notice that nobody there seems to mind. <laughs> They're having rather a good time of it. And in fact, have organized a little sequence of stones so that you can get across the deeper water part of it. Nobody seems to mind the mud in the background. And then there are those buildings and the roofs going back up the hill. Uh, but that, that's what sort of first caught my attention, this notion of the, the, the image of something that's a real mess. But then it, it drew me into it from that point. Let me ask you if there's anything that you notice about uh, this messy picture. When was it taken? 1954, right after the war, yeah. The Korean War lasted from 1950 to 1953. And so this is in what is still, I would say, the aftermath of the, of the Korean War. Um, if you date it and then connect things to it, you're adding something, it seems to me, to the picture. Um, you're saying there was something there at that time in the aftermath of the war. Uh, when Mr. Bacon and I went to Korea in the Peace Corps, 
it was 13 years after the end of the Korean War in 1966. And when I went there, it seemed to me, oh, 13 years is so long ago. That's what I thought. 13 years is nothing. And many of the things, many of the features of the landscape in Korea in 1966 were, I think, very much as they had been at the time of the Korean War and reflected the devastating uh, combat and, and resource depletion and other things. Uh, that was a, an awful and a brutal war. Uh, and there was something still there visible in the landscape, even into the 1960s, that reflected that. And that may be in the background of this picture as well. Probably late. Um, it's probably late uh, summer, early fall. It, the no gaze on the trees, and the, the fact that there's uh, there's probably rice uh, coming in into Seoul uh, at a time when uh, there was a lot of near starvation in the countryside um, shows you what a pull that uh, what a privilege uh, Seoul still had uh, in being able to get that quantity of food right uh, in, into the you know into the capital and and probably the market uh, nearby. So there's, again, a sense of a, of a season in the year, and the rice indeed would have been harvested and made available to the market in the ending part of the uh, fall season. In Seoul, um, when we went there in 1966, there were ox carts and horse carts going through uh, City Hall Plaza. It was a very, very uh, different place than it is now with everything else going on, including wonderful concerts, uh, just outside the window if you're staying at the Plaza Hotel. But um, big bag loads of rice coming into the city, an interesting observation. This one by Joo myung Duk, uh, the Henry Holt Memorial Orphanage, 1965. Um, a year before I went to Korea. Uh, what do you notice? What catches your attention as you look at that photograph? Yes. Gachi mm -hmm. brings that uh, good news. So you said it's taken at orphanages. So I don't know. He's waiting for good news. Could be, mm -hmm. yeah. So, She's looking. I mean, those of you who read Korean, she or he, yes. many of you, mm -hmm. many of you do. Mm -hmm. uh, what you see on the blackboard, gak gak gak, and then achime uh, gachiga. The gachiga, the ga is behind the boy's head, some obscured by it. But ka 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 in the morning, achime gachiga, the gachi. But that's all that's there on the blackboard. Could be something about good news coming. Yeah. Could I be. I think it's it he or she's been hoping to hear good news. Yeah. <laughs> I what, can, yeah. How did it get on the blackboard? Look, there's a book that he's holding in his left hand. <laughs> and he may be writing something out of the book on okay. the blackboard. As so sort we of, can also view that way or a different way, maybe just to teaching Korean teaching Korean language. language. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 1965. What else do you notice about that young lad? Yes. Of course, high school, but there's some uh, fixed feeling in his heart that is shown on his posture to me. No smiles. Now in Korea, if we teach that age, I don't know, maybe 11 years old, 10 years old, I think their body gesture will be very different. Right, this right. Vertical looking and the focus of that eyes looking to the camera will be very different. I think we have to say to the boy, hmm. would you please stand still? Would you please? Repeating, repeating. This boy comes from a different world. Yeah, I, yeah. I think he's probably a little older than 
how my child would be learning or writing things like that. And so perhaps if somebody that is in the orphanage mm -hmm. and is learning Korean, um, you know, actually uh, four or five years after um, and other children of his age have learned that work for that type of right, thing. Right. It seems a little um, like, the, you know, it's a second grade thing and he's, you know, fifth grade or <laughs> that, that sort of thing. So. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you do the mathematics, if you bring mathematics into the equation, you notice that the photograph was taken in 1965. And we're guessing, looking at him, that he might be something like 10, 11 years old, which would take it back into 1955, 1954, which is at the time when the foreign military presence was huge in South Korea. And, and one of the difficult outcomes of that was there were a lot of children born to Korean women whose fathers were foreigners, Americans, many of them, who went back when they were rotated out of service in Korea and never had contact with their children ever again. And this boy's posture and his face, his expression, uh, there's, a, there's a sadness and a depth to it that I think is very, very compelling, but troubling. And I think that might be why this photograph is there in the exhibit and might be one of the things that the photographer, who took a number of photographs over a fairly extended period of time at this Henry Holt orphanage, this might be one of the things that drew him there to this uh, young boy there at the orphanage and, and to take this picture. Well, one last. It's by Kim Ki-chan, seen from inside an alley. And there are several others in the exhibit uh, and in the exhibit book, scenes from inside an alley. And, and the notes, the very helpful notes on this say that he went there uh, to have a chance to meet and talk with people who lived in the alley um, to get a sense of their lives in Seoul as it was changing uh, with the rapid, rapid uh, growth of the urban uh, centers in Seoul and other cities in Korea. The date on this is uh, 1978. Chang um, Lim Dong in Seoul. Um, do any of you notice that large monster in the background? <laughs> it's almost like a Korean uh, sci-fi movie. There's the new urban scene. And shortly after this photograph was taken, it swallowed up these alleys and small houses. And the people who had lived there had to move out again. Um, and there's that sad part of it, that record of a period of Korea's changing, rapidly changing urban life, that I think is there if you read into it something of the history and, and other things. But also, if you focus on those kids, there's one holding the umbrella with a little baby on her back, the old traditional way of carrying around the little infants, and then somebody else over to the side. They seem to be having a conversation about something on one of those rainy days in Seoul, and then off in the distance, the city. And one of the things I love about this photograph is the depth that it has. You have people in the relatively close um, proximity to the camera, lined up with the walls of the buildings on each side of them, but then through it and out the other side in that lighted space extending out to those huge buildings off in the distance, there's a wonderful sort of sense of depth that to me is very compelling, that pulls my attention. And it's not so much thinking about it and analyzing it, but having a sense of it as a composition of something very beautifully organized and arranged, uh, a snapshot, a photograph, uh, not a painting, and nevertheless something that I think has, has really describable qualities as a work of art, of, of photography. Uh, it could be a painting, it could have been a poem, but in this case, something different. Well, let me say then, having looked at these photographs with you, a few words about some poems that I find interesting uh, from Korea. 
those two 16th century poems that I mentioned. And then maybe only just to save time, one from the 20th century, but one that I've been fascinated by for all, all the years since I was uh, first in Korea back in the uh, early part of the, well, anyway, long time ago, 1966. Um, and we'll think about them as poems and, and what they mean, which has something to do with history and what we can say about these photographs in the exhibit as records of history at a particular time in Korea's 20th century. But then there's more to the poems than just the history that they represent. And I want to say a few things about that to go back then to the photographs and look at things like line and the extension of line and the contrast to the foreground and the background and the interplay between light and dark surfaces. And then through all of that, the very strong human qualities that I think are there in these photographs in the collection. But the first poem that I want to mention to you um, is a 16th century uh, Shijo poem. Shijo is S-I-J-O. And it's a, a form of Korean poetry that I've become very interested in. It's kind of a counterpart uh, to the Japanese haiku in being vernacular, which is to say in the Korean language, not in classical Chinese, which was the language for formal poetry in Korea up until the very late 19th and actually into the 20th century. Quite a lot of Chinese poetry, hanshi, was still published in the 1920s as modern Korean literature was getting underway. But no, the Shijo was a vernacular verse form. It's in, how many, how many please raise your hands if you've heard of the Shijo before. Um, Okay, some of some of you have. All right. Well, I, I won't go on and on about it, but it's it's three lines, and it is said that the first line sort of gets the thing going, and then the second line sort of keeps it going, whatever is happening in the poem. But then in the third line, you always have a sort of little twist, a turn in the direction of the poem, or a shift in the focus to something else, and then the resolution of the poem and the balance of that third line. And in a way, that's seen as kind of a compression of the Chinese classical quatrain, that is the four-line classical Chinese poem, um, or like the ones that Li Bo and Du Fu wrote back in the 7th century, 6th century in China and before, um, in front of the bed, the bright moon shines. I think it must be frost on the ground. I raise my head and gaze at the moon. I lower my head and I think of home. That's, for me, one of the most beautiful of all the Chinese hanshi, uh, but from, from China itself. Shijo has something of the same sequence of moves, but in just three lines. And I'll give you one now. Um, it's a poem by a kiseng woman, which is to say a professional entertainer, something like the Japanese geisha. And... There was a, a f this woman has <laughs> been recently on television with several TV series, drama series about her. Books have been written about her. Movies have been done about her. Uh, she's a very compelling figure, a very strong individual in the 16th century at a time when Korean women were kept in a particular place. They were seen as belonging in the home. And, and so you have this phrase in Korean, chip saram meaning the wife, the one who stays in the home, whereas the pakat yangban, the yangban, the gentleman, is outside, dealing with the world at large. So there's sort of this in the background. This Kisang woman had heard there was somebody, a, a, an, off, an official in the government, who had said to his friends that he wasn't at all impressed by this Kisang named Huang Jini, uh, no matter what people said about her intelligence and her wit, her capacity for composing poetry, for singing and all that, he, he just didn't care. And somewhat in response to that, Huang Jini composed the Shijo, or at least the, the story says that, it, that she did. And it goes like this. Uh, 
일도 창해하면 다시 오기 어려워라. 명월이 만공산 하니 수역한들 어떠라. And you can sort of sense the structure of that as a poem, I think. The first line is 청사리 벽해 수야 수위 감을 자랑 마라. 일도 창해하면 다시 오기 어려워라. 명월이 만공산 하니 수역한들 어떠라. So that's the, th the three lines of that Shijo poem. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Those of you who don't know the, the Korean original, it's uh, jade green stream in these blue hills. Don't be so proud of passing by so easily. That's the first line. Once you reach the wide sea, to come back again will be hard. Second line. Third line. While the bright moon fills these empty hills, why not pause and then go on, if you will? Now, we can look at that as a piece of sort of landscape painting. The jade green stream and the blue hills and the wide sea and the moon. It makes me think a little bit of that folding screen in the background there. We can see some of those images of the hills and the water and the clouds and the birds and um, it's got that quality to it as a, as a piece of writing, as something in language. It's also got something more because it's a comment about life that all these busy people dashing about, if they don't stop and pay attention to the world around them, before they know it, they're going to be gone in that vast, wide sea that lies on the other side of life. And before that happens, while the bright moon fills these hills, stop, stop for a moment, and then go on, if you will. It seems to me like a, a great word of advice for everybody dashing around in the, in the urban scene these days in New York or Seoul, wherever you happen to be, furiously text messaging, and, and the world is flashing past, and folks don't don't pay don't pay much attention to that as it happens. So that's got a kind of a philosophical side to it as well. I think that poem. It's got a little bit more to it as well. It's got a bit of an edge to it. It's a game on words because pyokkesu, which means jade green stream, was also with different Chinese characters, the title of office held by this fellow who said he was indifferent to the charms of Huang Jinyi. So in a way that beginning line says, oh, Mr. Confucian scholar, don't be boasting so proud of passing by so easily because once you're gone, you're gone. And then there's a twist in that third line, Myungwol, bright moon, was the sort of key saying name for Huang Jinyi. That's how she was known as a Kisang, not her family name, but her professional name. And so she's saying, while bright moon is here filling the empty hills, why not pause and then go on, if you will? So it's got a kind of playful, uh, challenging quality to it as an expression of uh, woman's feelings toward the male establishment in the 16th century Korea in which she lived. And there's one more thing worth pointing out about this particular poem. The first half of each line is in Chinese character-derived language. Chong Sa Ri is three Chinese characters in the Blue Mountains. Pyok Ge Su, Jade Green Stream, again, is three Chinese characters. Il To Chang He, once reach the broad sea. Again, that's four Chinese characters. And then in the third line, Myung Wal, right moon, is Chinese characters. Man Gong San, fills the empty hills, is Chinese characters. So the beginning of each line is in Chinese character language, as if it were all, for example, French-derived English language or German-derived language. 
the last half of each line is in pure Korean and very feisty. Sui kamul jarang mara. Don't be so proud of going so easily. Tashi yogi oriwara. To come back again will be very difficult. Suyo kandul otora. Why don't you pause and then go on, if you will? It's very kind of feisty, confrontational language, witty, a woman speaking to the, the male authority structures of 16th century Korea. And what I loved about the story of this Shijo poem, when people told it to me, was that I don't know if he processed all this information at once as he was uh, on his mule crossing a stream, but it is said that the Pyokkesu, the guy that this was aimed at, heard it and fell off his mule in the middle of the stream. It got him, you know? And it's almost like uh, texting. It's almost like listening uh, on the internet. It's almost like pulling down a tune from YouTube and looking at it and thinking, wow, that Kangnam style is really something. Um, so that's one poem. Another one, also from the 16th century, again, something of a landscape poem by a very famous Confucian scholar official whose name was Zheng Chul, um, who was very, very feisty. He was involved in the factional conflicts and, and, and difficulties of that period and more than once was dismissed from his office and then was able to come back into his office uh, as things changed, as the political atmosphere changed a little bit, and then he'd make sure that those who had engineered his dismissal were themselves sent away or, or worse. But he composed an absolutely incredible Shijo poem that doesn't have to do quite with the fights and the factional disputes of that time um, in Korea. It's, it's a very different thing indeed. Um, and... In Korean, it's as follows. Mul are krim jini dari wie jungi kanda. Cho junga koi kara. No kanande muroboja. Makdero hingurum kari kimyo. Tora anipogo kanomera. And you might recognize it if you're at all familiar with Korean Shijo. Um, it starts out with sort of a brush painting of the landscape. It goes into the water, a shadow falls. Over the bridge, a monk passes. There's a translation of it by Richard Rutt in his book, The Bamboo Grove, of that second line. Um, Reverend Sir, stop a moment. Let me ask where you are going. So the speaker in the poem addresses that monk. Uh, and then the third line, with his staff, that's the turn in the third line, with his staff pointing at the white clouds, he goes on his way without turning to look back. It's a beautifully evocative sketch of a landscape and a couple of people in it. I don't know if there are people in that particular landscape, um, but often in Korean landscape paintings of the pre-modern period, you get these beautiful landscapes and then small people making their way through it. And this particular Shijo focuses in on two of them. Zheng Chol, as I said, was an official involved in all of the disputes at uh, the court uh, that were, were part of that life. But at that time in the 16th century, the Confucian court, the Confucian government was trying to push Buddhism out to the edges and establish Confucianism as the real way of doing business in government and elsewhere in the society and the culture at large. And it was a push back against the strong history of Buddhism in the Koryo period, which had been very characteristic of the painting and the art and other material things uh, from the Koryo period. And there was a revolution in 1392, a new dynasty established. And part of that new dynasty establishing itself 
was the Confucian push against Buddhism. And so that history is in back of that poem. Into the water a shadow falls, over the bridge a monk is passing. So this Confucian official notices a monk. So there's a little bit of an edge to that description. And that edge leaps out in the second line of the poem. In Korean, as I said, Hey, you monk, stop right there. I want to ask about where you are going. So here is this Confucian official calling out this monk and saying, hold on, I'm asking you, I'm telling you, stop, and I'm going to ask you about where you're going. It's sort of an investigative uh, query right there. And then the monk, it's incredible, with his staff pointing at the white clouds, he goes on his way without turning to look back. He doesn't even reply directly. He points, and it's sort of that same gesture that you find in that beautiful poem by Huang Jini toward that next world, the broad sea or the white clouds. And that's the journey that this monk is on, not caught in this world and all of its factional disputes, but going somewhere else. And the poem registers that beautifully. It's not Zhang Chal saying, oh, I should have got him or anything like that. It's Zhang Chal laying out his encounter with the monk. We have a voice message in that second line from the 16th century. We can pick up the phone and we can hear Zhang Chal say it in the language of the 16th century. Pick it up again and, and he's still there. And what I love about the poem is, how do people answer voice messages? Well, you can send a text message, right? And that's what the monk does. And on he goes. It's, it's to me, just marvelously communicative, complicated, rich representation of life in Korea in the 16th century as so many of these photographs were. All right, one last, one last 20th century poem, and then we'll come back to a muddy street. Um, there's a very famous poem. Oh, thank you. Some more, but some more would be great. There's a very famous poem from the 20th century by a poet named Kim So Wol, who lived from 1902 to 1934 published one collection of poems in 1925 called Azaleas, Jindalekot. And that was the poem and that was the poet that really captured my attention and interest when I was in Korea in the two years when I was there in the Peace Corps in Andong. And I would read these poems and I found this wonderful book that had translations of the poems and then on the facing page, the originals, so I could get a sense of what the original was and then try to make sense of it for myself. And I discovered, um, I began to memorize the poems, trying so hard to make sense of it. Probably like that boy at the blackboard. Ka, 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 chi me, ka, chi ga. Wonder what happens next. This poem by So Wol, uh, I would say is one of the best known of all 20th century Korean poems. And as I said, it's called Azaleas, which in Korean is Jindale Got. And let me just let you hear it in Korean and then English and then say a few words about it. Jindalegot. Nabogi ga yokyo kashil denen. Maropsi koi pone duri yurida. Yongbyona yak san jindalegot. Arumdada kashil kire puri yurida. Kashi nung korum korum noin kukochul. Sapuni churio palko kashi opsoso. And in English translation, it would be something like, when you leave, sick of seeing me, 
without a word I shall send you on your way from Mount Yak in Yangbyon, an armful of azaleas I shall gather and scatter on your path away. Step by step on the flowers lying before you tread deeply but softly and go. When you leave, sick of seeing me, though I die, I shall not shed a tear. In many Korean literary histories, uh, that book, that, that poem is described as an expression of the Korean people's feeling of sadness in the years following the unsuccessful March 1st, 1919 independence demonstrations, the independence movement. Some writers um, and some books say sulpum, sadness of the Korean people. Others say it expresses the Korean sense of Han, of this sadness, but something more than that, a, a certain kind of sometimes resentment. The sort of thing, for example, that women were said to feel about the way society was structured in the pre-modern period, or the way others felt when the government oppressed them or took away their rights or other things of that sort. This sense of Han is something that's said to be very characteristic of uh, the Korean people and their history. So this poem published in 1925 was said to express that in the books that were published in the 1960s and the 1970s for Korean school children to learn about their history and their, and their culture. There's that, there's that sort of resigned sadness in the poem. Uh, but there's more to that poem than just a resigned sadness. There's more to it that pulls you in. And one of the features of it that I find very interesting is how well it fits into um, what in evolutionary psychology is referred to as cheater detection. And the idea there is that as human beings in society, we've got kind of a, an evolved capacity to enter into uh, agreements with other people, whether they're written out formal or informal, to accomplish certain ends that we can't accomplish by ourselves. But that's how society works. That's how culture works, that people work together. That's an interesting beginning point. But what I find especially interesting is the theory goes on to say we have an evolved capacity to detect when people are cheating. And it always draws our attention very quickly. And we notice, oh, somebody isn't living up to his or her end of the agreement. And I think there's something of that in a lot of country and Western music, when you walked out the door and so on and so forth, and it keeps bringing us back. Well, then what? When she walked out the door, then, then what happened? And it plays on that um, kind of human uh, interest that we have in what, what next? And this poem by Kim so Wall has got something of that to it as well. It starts out saying, Nabogiga yokyo kashidenan. So when you get sick of seeing me and you go, and I think that pulls a reader in, what, what next? And the third line in that stanza says, Madopsi koi pone duririda. Without a word, I shall send you on your way. What I think is very clever about the poem, though, is it makes a promise, it makes a contract in the first stanza, not to say anything more, ma'aropsi, no more words. But then it goes on for three more stanzas with these extravagant gestures. I'm going to go up to Yongbyon, to Mount Yak, and gather his alias. And then a third stanza, and it keeps on going, and it keeps on going. And I think that pulls us in as readers. It engages us with that poem in a way that doesn't have anything specifically to do with Korea's history under the Japanese colonial occupation, and yet has much to do, I think, with the way that poem has engaged readers over the decades since it was first published in 1925. A last comment about it would be um, 
maybe it's a poem about being a poem. When you get sick of looking at me, the poem, you, the reader, well, okay, without a word, you can go on your way. But then the poem keeps unfolding and unfolding, and that's something that I think a poem does in a, in a remarkable way. Well, I'm going to stop there for a second, because what I've hoped to do with talking about these um, kind of iconic examples of Kriya's literature is to suggest that at the first we can look at them maybe as representing something about Kriya's history, something about that particular moment in Kriya's history even, or about perhaps the relations between the scholar officials and the monk class, the Buddhist monks, or between men and women, or between the speaker in that poem, Azaleas, and the other, the one who is going away. I think all of those meanings can be discovered in the poems, but I think also there's much more to them than that, or they wouldn't keep drawing people back to them. And that's what I'd like to turn to these photographs for a last look and see uh, if there's something of that to them. And to make that move, I'm hoping you might share with us that poem by Kim Soo Young, Muddy Streets, Keep in Mind. I'd like to read a poem by Kim Soo Young called Closer Root. Since my pronunciation isn't good, I'm going to pass out uh, the printout of the poem. Before reading, I must give you a caution for it's some wrong language, but I think we're a mature audience here, so please bear with me. Colossal Root, Kim Soo Young. I still do not know how to sit properly. Three of us happen to have a drink. Two of them sit with one foot resting on top of the knees, not cross-legged, while I sit in southern style, simply cross-legged. On such occasions, the other two being from the northern parts, I adjust my sitting position. After liberation in 45, one poet, Kim byung -uk, used to sit like a Japanese woman, kneeling as he talked. He was top though, having worked four hard years in a steel factory while attending university in Japan. I'm in love with Isabel Burr Bishop. She was the first head of the British Loyal Geographical Society to visit Korea in 1893. She saw the dramatic scene as Seoul abruptly changed into a world of women, men banishing as the curfew gong of Yin Gyeongjeon rang. A beautiful time, only bearers, eunuchs, foreigner servants, and government officials were allowed to walk the street. Then she described how at midnight the woman disappeared and the men emerged swaggering up to their debaucheries. She had not seen any country with such a remarkable custom anywhere else in the world, she said, while Queen Min, who ruled the country, could never leave her palace. Traditions, no matter how filthy, are good. I passed Gwangamun intersection, recall the mud there used to be by Shigumun, the exit door for the dead. Remember how women heated cauldrons of lye and did their washing in the stream bed next to Inwan's in-laws. Since encountering Mrs. Bishop, it is not so hard for me to put up with Korea, rotten country though it is. Rather, I'm owed by it. History, no matter how filthy, is good. Mud, no matter how filthy, is good. When I have memories ringing more resonant than a breast rice bowl, humanity grows eternal and love likewise. When I'm in love with Mrs. Bishop, the progressives and socialists are motherfuckers. Unification and neutrality are shit. Secrecy, profundity, learning, 
dignity, conventions should all go to the secret agency. The Oriental Development Company, Japanese consulates, Korean civil servants, and ice cream too should all go suck Yankee cock. But chamber pots, headbands, long pipes, garden shops, lacquer furniture stores, apothecaries selling old dysentery remedies, silk shoe stores, leather shops, pockmarked folks, one-eyed people, barren women, ignorant folks, anything reactionary is good in order to stand on this land. Even the underwater beams of the Third Han River Bridge are, compared to the colossal root I'm putting down in my land, merely the fluff on Moses' back, compared to the colossal root I'm putting down in my land. Suggestive of a mammoth in horror movies with black buffs unable to concert, um, excuse me, unable to entertain magpies or crows. Compared with the colossal root, that even I cannot imagine. Thank you so much. That's um, a poem by Kim Soo Young, who died in 1968 as he was rushing to get onto the bus to get home before curfew. Uh, and he was struck and killed by, by one of the buses in, in downtown Seoul. But he's a poet who wrote about the, the details, the dirty ones and the different ones and all that was going on in Korea in this period, and I think had almost a photographic eye in his poetry to register, to capture in words what it was that was characteristic of Seoul and the life of the people there at that time. And Chang Jae described uh, being fascinated, loving this poem for a, lo a long time in his his um, enjoyment of Korean literature. Well, let me close with a few observations about muddy streets. Not Kim Soo Young, but look at that picture and move away from thinking about the content, move away from thinking about the particular time and think only of the photograph. And notice the triangles, the triangle of light in the water, the triangle of the young person's legs as he leaps from one stone to the next. The triangles moving back into the distance in that photograph and then leaping up in the roof lines of the buildings behind. And it's almost like a composition uh, theme and variations on the triangle. A basic design element in uh, pictures, in painting, uh, and I would say also in, in poetry that we have seen this connection between the reader and the poet and the poem. This particular picture is a striking one. We've talked about uh, some of its features, the joyful children. Uh, think though about Seoul, uh, about Korea in 1945, shortly after the end of the Japanese colonial occupation. And imagine if any of today's young Korean people were up in that tree, they'd break its branches because they would weigh twice as much as those kids do. We don't think of it right away, but those are children who are as light as birds. And I think their, their lack of weight suggests something about Korea's uh, difficult years leading up to this amazing point. Notice also, though, that tree is almost alone in the landscape. And one of the things that I found very disturbing about being in Korea in the 1960s was that on the hills, there were no trees anywhere. The only place you could find trees was in some of the Buddhist temple grounds and other sacred areas. But the trees in the Korean landscape, so richly represented in that folding screen back there and elsewhere, had all been taken down and used for firewood. Korea was in a very difficult period of time um, economically, and if you look out over that landscape, there are no trees. Park Jong-hee, as it happens, in the 1960s, started a reforestation program, and as a teacher at the Andong Agriculture and Forestry High School, every year I was involved with the students going out up into the hills and the mountains around Andong, planting trees, and now Korea is completely changed, and 
uh, has a very beautifully treed landscape. But one thing also, if you keep looking at things, you'll notice design elements, you'll notice repeating features. And do you see that other tree in the background? There is another one. I, I don't know if the photographer went all over Korea till he could find that one. But that's the tree that I find fascinating because it's like a human, a dancer in some kind of ceremony lifting a flail of some kind in a dance, maybe to charm the spirits away, maybe to bring them to the land, to bring back the fertility to the Korean uh, landscape that had been there in the past and that the people missed at the time. But it's got a very mysterious look to it. Um, I think of it as something of a, of a tree spirit represented in that moment of lifting up the magical flail and trying to call the, the spirits down into the land once again. And then finally this one, looking at it again, the sense of the, the shapes, not so much the story of the overtaking of this one urban landscape by the other, the modern one, the monster one, but of the tranquility, almost as if that's a screen on each side and those three people there are, are poised at this moment. There's something really lovely about the way that works and then the light on this flooded street and how it leads out into the light of the city beyond it, I find just fascinating. It's something interesting about the design of the photograph, not just about the content. And that's something that I find very compelling too about Korean poetry over the years, about the Korean landscape and the way it keeps changing and keeps drawing me back. And thank you so much for uh, being here and letting us share with you something about this uh, set of photographs and about Korea's culture. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for the presentation. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask him. And gallery will remain open. So please feel free to walk around to see more of the photos. Any questions? <laughs> When you first started looking at um, uh, the uh, Jindal got the uh, Azalea's poem, um, I remember doing the same thing and finding oh, at least a half dozen translations. And you know, they disagree. There were footnotes, and they disagreed. How, how did you settle on? Uh, I mean, because it, it is such a, um, a important uh, uh, poem that so many people know parts of, and so on. How did you settle on a translation in, into uh, or the, the English? Um, part of it. it. Is it your your own? Or? There's, there's um, a translation that I did, which is in this book, the Columbia Anthology of Modern Korean Poetry. Um, it, it keeps changing uh, as I think of that poem and how to represent it in the English language. Um, and I alter some words here and there. I'm, I'm working on a very strange narrative poem about uh, a woman who is the uh, Madam in a coffee house in Seoul in the 1920s. And there are some guys there in the shop um, and they're reading some of the materials that got submitted to the magazine that they're editing. And one of them is this poem, Azaleas. And in that manuscript, I do a very different uh, translation of the poem. Um, I think a live poem keeps doing that to you. It keeps changing the way you think of it, the way you hear it. Uh, those of you who know Korean will perhaps appreciate or perhaps not this translation of the poem into different Korean. Nabogiga yokyoa kashiltenin kunyan kai keisekiya. Hmm. You know, when you leave weary of seeing me, oh, go on, you little son of a bitch. I don't care. Um, that's not really a translation of the poem. But it's still there. It doesn't care what I do to it. 
Do any of you know the 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 song Barbary Ellen? Do you know that one? Twas in the merry month of May when green buds they were swelling. Sweet William on his deathbed lay for love of Barbary Ellen. Ma bogie ga yokyo ka sultanen maropsi koi pone duri urida. And the, the song moves. It was known as a folk song poem, Minyo Si, and it slides into a folk song. It also works as bossa nova. It works as blues. So the question about how to translate it, I think poems will keep bringing people to them, reading them, memorizing them, and translating them in lots of different ways, including into music. Better than I do. Any other? Yes? So it may be uh, poetry and feature uh, we are exposed to this evening, but I thought uh, while you were uh, explaining the tradition and History, uh, Yi Guang Su's hook, the elements of the novel are directly related to any of these. Yes, aspects. indeed. Yeah. Removing the, all these uh, things from the novel, the core spirit of hook by Yi Guang Su, the contemporary of that uh, generation, is interconnects. Korean soul, right, always right. yearning, always having problems summarized in Han. Yes. They think their problems are bigger than anybody else's. Their world, I think, was very small. Therefore, the world, the vocabulary Han had to be created in Korean soul. They never knew the problems uh, in hungry countries or broken countries. They thought that their problems were the biggest problems uh, on their shoulders. And Yi Guang Su goes to that, but he doesn't bury themselves under that problem. He comes out with some salvation spirit. But I don't know whether I see that salvation for their Han problems in poetry. It leaves. The, the Han is something that's there in the poetry and that people have read back into Korean poetry of the pre-modern period. Um, those of you who are interested in Korea and the study of it um, may be interested to know that, that Han as a word certainly existed uh, for a long period of time, but it was not used to describe Korea, the people, the culture, and their sense of themselves until the 1970s. And all of a sudden, Han began to get a lot of scholarly attention, and you see it in a lot of scholarly articles published at that time. Um, if you look in the back of one of the collected poems of Kim so Wol, you'll find a list of articles written about him. And I've done this a couple of times. And you'll notice all of a sudden in the 1970s, Han and Sowell's poetry, Han, and so on and so forth. It's still, though, even though I think it's a neologism, it's a very strongly characteristic feature as people think about, about Korea. And, and one I think people do find compelling in trying to understand the basic elements of of Korea's culture and, and history. The, the story, the novel, uh, Yi Guang Su's Hook, Earth, uh, was published um, in the late teens and, and expresses something about the changing sense of Korea's relationship to the land. And there were a lot of other works done at that time. An amazing um, story called Kamja, Potatoes, um, which gets at something of the same shift from land and farming into the urban life. It's a very strong um, short story. And, and there are a number of others that engage with that aspect. Also, one of the things that I think is interesting is the shift from the sense in the 1920s of the land as mogu, the motherland, to under Park Jung-hee, choguk, the fatherland. And in the works of literature from the 1920s, you can often see the landscape represented as kind of reaching out to embrace the people who lived there. And then under the different sense of the landscape and the land, you get more of a, of a push back 
from the landscape and a, and a shift in the representation of it in the writing in the 1960s and the 1970s. This is a very interesting feature of Korean literature and one that actually uh, not enough people have written about. I think it'd be very interesting to hear more on this. Maybe one more question and then, or are we, are we all set? Yes? One of the things that, and it's probably a, a subject for another of your presentations, um, the, the whole sort of concept of hometown, you know, and the people that, you know, three quarters of the people that live in Seoul came from somewhere else and they yearn for, you know, their Koyang and where they came from. And under the Japanese, there, there was just longing for something that never really was, but, you know, the, the sort of the more patriotic Kind of related, to, <laughs> kind of related to uh, what you were saying, but um, I, you know, I think that's something that may be uh, a period, and it has become almost a period thing, where you know there's not much more of that. Uh, you know, you're you're composing poems about other things, but the whole uh, concept of Koyan and the lost uh, country or the motherland, the fatherland, uh, is, is almost disappearing. It certainly disappeared from. The sky, as you look down, you know, at that landscape and that interconnected uh, set of highways, and yet I think, as you're suggesting, people do still have a strong sense of an identification with an area that the family came from and where the family records might be kept and where the ancestors might be buried and where on a certain day in the year people go for the, uh, the rites at the ancestors' uh, grave sites. A, a very strong identification of human life with the natural world all around. I think in these photographs, you'll see that too, that this wonderful sense of the land and of the place. I mean, I, I only showed you four. Uh, there's some amazingly evocative uh, photographs of people and, and the landscape of Korea, a very strong sense. And yet it isn't just a simple, joyful feeling. Uh, it's a very complicated one, because when you look back at Korea in the 1950s and the 1960s, there were real struggles and tensions. There was unbelievably dire poverty that was almost universal. South Korea had a lower GNP than North Korea in the 1960s. And it wasn't until you get those five-year plans up and running that all of a sudden South Korea takes off. Uh, but that too then has, uh, for all of the success of the Korea wave and Korean music and pop, films, TV, and, and, and movies, and, and the rest of it in the world today, uh, there are a lot of folks who wonder, well, what's our connection still to that sense of kohyang, of, of a home where we came from? Well, let's pause. Let's stop. And, and thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you.